so so indeed in this crisis it's uh, it's important that we understand human behavior um as uh, we of course we all want to get out of uh, this uh, this uh, situation so we need as many people as possible to um, take the vaccine and to go to test so that we can control this uh, virus finally um, and we wanted to understand better how people can become motivated to do so so currently in Europe, we have still a debate that's uh, focused on scarcity of vaccines. But hopefully uh, in a couple of weeks, a um, few months, we will be at the point that there's a lot of supply and then it will be about how do we get as many people as possible on board. We already have this problem uh, today in the hospitals, for example, where the vaccines were offered early on, but not everybody took the vaccine. And as you can imagine, if somebody who takes care of cancer patients, say, is not vaccinated and then infects patients, this uh, can have really, really bad uh, consequences. And then, of course, there's other countries like the US where the supply is there, uh, but the take up is not as high uh, as one uh, would hope for. So they are, uh, the results are already now quite uh, relevant, I think. And for testing, early on in this crisis, we offered nodal points, so to say, so people with many contacts uh, to get tested regularly. This happened uh, in the schools, for example. The teachers uh, were asked to please go and test regularly, but many didn't do so because it meant they had to go to the doctors or to some testing center and that that eats up time. This is costly in this sense. Uh, and if you don't show symptoms, it may be quite understandable that often teachers then decided uh, not to go. But for the spread of the disease, this is obviously uh, not that good. It would be better if people went and uh, tested regularly. So here we want to see how can we motivate people to engage more in these behaviors. And this is to illustrate the situation in the US. And this is data from um, up to um, the day before yesterday. So it's, it's, it's quite new data. And you can see, uh, so uh, this is the demand for the vaccine. Supply is there, uh, but the demand has peaked in April and now it's really going down. And at the same time, it's a bit less than half the population only um, that has taken the first shot of the vaccine. And you have all these experts currently that discuss which threshold we are going to need to control this virus and what uh, Dr. Fauci is saying, for example, um, and also what the Robert Koch Institute is saying that we need something like 80, like 80 percent amongst the whole population to be vaccinated. And we cannot vaccinate the kids yet. So amongst the grown ups, we need definitely more than 80 percent of take up in the US. We are far away from that. And um, I really, really hope that in Germany we will come as close as possible or even above these 80 percent uh, amongst the grown ups, but it, it may not be trivial to get there. So what we look into is um, behavioral approaches. We look into nudging um, in the form of pre-scheduled appointments. I guess many of you have experienced that if they wanted to get a vaccine uh, appointment, uh, this, this was really tedious. Or if you try to book a vaccine appointment for a relative, um, for example, in Germany, you had to call up a number, but they never could help you. Um, or you had to spend a lot of time on the internet. And I also hear that from, from other countries, that it's really difficult to get your vaccine appointment. Um, now, instead, of course, you could offer vaccine appointments to people, and that would make it uh, much, much easier to, to, to get the vaccine. We know from uh, flu vaccination that pre-scheduled appointments indeed increase the take up. So we had the hope that also when it comes to Corona, if you make this vaccine very accessible, that uh, intentions to vaccinate increase. But of course, Corona is a different thing than the flu, um, as you can imagine. Uh, so it's, it's not clear that you can directly transport these uh, very good results from the flu shots uh, to Corona. So you really need a study for that. And then we also look into a um, more standard economic approach, uh, um, throwing money at the problem. So offering people money 
um, to take the vaccine. And we will also combine these two measures. So we will look into these behavioral measures, the nudging, the pre-scheduled appointments, and, uh, and throwing at the money at the problem together. Um, and we want to see if this helps. Now, compensations have been discussed quite uh, controversially, uh, but there is already a bunch of employers that have started to pay people for vaccination. So just to give you some examples, uh, there is, uh, for example, an employer in Baden-Württemberg in Germany, uh, and uh, there they hand out bottles of alcohol if people uh, take the vaccine. Uh, and then there's many U.S. employers that have started uh, to pay their employees. For example, Aldi uh, in the U.S., they pay um, actually not that much, maybe something like $20, so some few hours of work pay. Uh, there's other examples like Houston Hospital, they pay $500 for people taking uh, their shots. And as you can imagine, for hospitals, it can be so important that they get as many people as possible vaccinated there. So um, it may be understandable that they really pay, pay a lot here. Um, it's just some, some overview. So you already see Lidl is very different in what they pay compared to uh, Aldi. Um, so it, it may be quite important to understand what do these compensations do? Do they work? Or is it just wasting money and the vaccine intentions do not change at all? Or, or may they even get crowded out? So uh, we wanted to understand that systematically and therefore you need a controlled study. So you need to uh, see, okay, what happens at the same time with comparable uh, people if they get offered uh, different monetary amounts and if they are uh, in different behavioral environments depending on whether uh, the vaccine is pre-scheduled or not. So here I'm going to present data from uh, December and from, uh, from February and um, we look into vaccine intentions and we look into uh, PCR testing. Uh, PCR testing, we can really uh, implement the decisions. So some of the participants will see their decisions realized and they will either get um, more or less money or the PCR test, uh, depending on their choices. PCR test, this is the gold standard. So it's not this uh, 15 minute super fast test, which is of course super useful PCR, um, has a higher standard, but it's also a more costly test. Um, so at the time of our study, the price of that test, if you don't show symptoms, yeah, so, so you have to buy it on the market, then it would be $120. Yeah, so about 120 euros, that's quite a bit of money. So uh, when it comes to the choice architecture, we will compare what happens if taking the vaccine is the default. So this happens because there's a pre-scheduled appointment. You don't have to do anything um, actively to get it. Um, and for the test, it's similar. So then the default is that you get the test instead of um, saving more money. And the opt-in, this is uh, the comparison treatment. There people have to uh, really become active to get their vaccine or to get their test. And uh, uh, for the compensations, we looked into different monetary values. For vaccination, there's actually almost all countries I'm aware of uh, offer this vaccine for free now. Uh, China first wanted to charge a bit, but I think they, uh, they gave up this idea and now offer it for free. Um, so we look into um, no compensation and into positive compensations up to $500, about 500 euros. And when it comes to testing, it's different uh, there. If you don't show symptoms, you may still want this test. Um, so you can be hopefully quite sure at least that you do not infect others and you may want this very, very precise, uh, good test, the PCR. Um, so we look into the market price of that and reductions of that and into um, some thank you payments for testing. And uh, this is the results. I start on the left-hand side, uh, side. What you can see is the red curve. This is when taking the vaccine is uh, pre-scheduled. This is your default, so to say, but you can, of course, opt out. And the black curve, this is when people have to make the appointment themselves. And then on the x-axis, you see this is the different monetary compensations. So if there is no compensation, you see there is a take-up of um, roughly 70% in people. 
you see if there's a high compensation, like $500, then the take up increases quite a bit. Uh, we get many more people on board. Um, if the appointment is pre-scheduled, then we even get into this direction of uh, more 90% than 80% uh, amongst the grown ups, which, which may be quite, quite good. Um, but you also see that uh, small monetary compensations, like 10 or $20 um, can really backfire. So this can crowd out the motivation to take the vaccine. So why could that happen? Uh, that could happen because, uh, well, suddenly you put a kind of price tag on, on this social and morally relevant activity of taking the vaccine. And if you see that price tag and it's so low, then maybe you start thinking, wow, uh, maybe I really overestimated the value of this vaccine shot yeah, for, for society. So that could be a reason kind of commodification effect. And, and you see this matters for these very small monetary amounts, but already $100, 100 euros, this already goes uh, um, into a significant positive um, um, direction. So then you can already increase the take up uh, quite a bit. And if you uh, think about what the IFO Institute has estimated, uh, what the social value of taking this vaccine is, uh, for Germany, they say it's uh, about 1,500 euros. So there's a lot of room for compensating people um, to take their shots. And if you think about hospital workers, what if the value is already 1,500 uh, for, for the average person, then for hospital workers, it, it must be so much larger, right? So if you think about all these nodal points, people with many contacts who could infect many other people, maybe vulnerable people, uh, the value that these people take their shots um, should be really, really high. And here on the right hand side, we have the test uh, results, um, willingness to test. And you see at uh, market price, there's not much interest in taking the test. <laughs> Most people don't want to pay that much. They prefer uh, having $120 uh, to getting the PCR test. Um, but this changes as prices come down. So, so the costs really matter. And, uh, and I think this is also explaining why uh, we see so little, we saw so little interest amongst teachers, for example, when it was quite costly to get tested. Yeah, because time is, of course, also a, a cost, right, that you have to invest. And um, it, it's, it, it's certainly a good idea to make the test very, very accessible if you want a high take up rate. We also had this discussion with travelers. Um, there was even countries who said, okay, travelers should pay themselves. There was also a huge moral debate. Uh, they should pay themselves for getting tested after their travels, or they were asked to go and see a doctor again and so on. So it's very right a lot how easy it was to get tested, whether it happened straight away at the airport and for free, or whether people had to become very active themselves to get tested. And I think this data illustrates that if people have to invest themselves uh, in invest their time and effort in course, then uh, the take up will be really low. And uh, then the testing will not help very much to understand uh, the spread of the virus. So in conclusion, what we see is that uh, compensations work if they are high enough. So in, in case of testing, it's easy, the, the lower the cost, the higher the test demand. Uh, but when it comes to the vaccine, uh, it's not a monotonic relationship. Uh, if you introduce compensations, they should be large enough. 100 euros would be good, for example, 10 euros, maybe not such a good idea, it could really backfire. Um, we also see that these behavioral methods, the nudging, the pre-scheduled appointments, uh, this, this works too. And it works at any monetary level. Um, if you find that interesting, we also have a, a more um, socioeconomic um, uh, sub-analysis. And we see that people with low education background or the elderly um, are specifically well addressed if there's pre-scheduled appointments. And so if, if you make this vaccine very accessible, uh, the vaccine intentions, specifically in these very vulnerable groups, uh, may increase quite a bit. But we also saw that you can really blend both approaches. You don't have to go only with the nudges or only with the compensations. You can all also work with both of them and they um, basically work independently. Yeah, so they would both add uh, to the uh, intentions to vaccinate if you do it the correct way. And the same was true for testing. 
Now, of course, there's a lot you could discuss about uh, these approaches. You could say, if we pre-schedule appointments, this may increase administrative costs because there will be people who may be now more likely reschedule their appointments than if they have to schedule them themselves in the first place. But if you look into the overall effort of getting an appointment and how this is done currently in quite many countries and also in Germany, how much effort, total effort is invested, then if you pre-scheduled appointments, it's very likely overall effort will come down quite a bit. And then uh, you could of course ask about the compensations, but should we also pay those who took the vaccine already? And I would say, yes, I think that would be fair to do so. And, and, and also it would um, take away weird incentives. You know, if you start paying, maybe somebody thinks, okay, they start paying now. If I wait even two months more, maybe they will pay even more. And, and that would be a very bad incentive, obviously. Um, from all these pandemic models, most important would be uh, certainly people with very many contacts, these nodal points, people in the hospitals or who work in supermarkets or in kindergartens and so on. And uh, so maybe uh, offering higher compensations to these people uh, is a specifically um, fruitful, fruitful approach. And this is also people who really had a tough, tough time in this crisis. So maybe also from a, from a moral perspective, uh, we would think that their uh, rewards may be in order. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Nora. Uh, excellent um, insights in your in your research and, and what we can learn from this for the the pandemic. I mean, we hopefully are approaching hopefully the end of this uh, pandemic, and um, in in Germany actually, it seems as if the people there's a high rush to vaccinate and um, and people want to work vaccinate and it's even you know people are looking for dates and and so on. So it's not yet. The situation like in the US, what would you think? Is there still a risk that we will have a similar situation, comparable situation in Germany, so that it, there will be a, a big need to uh, incentivize people to, to vaccinate themselves? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I really hope that there will be a lot of demand and as the supply goes up, still there will be a lot of demand and of course um, attitudes towards the vaccine also change over time. Um, but uh, also in Germany, we have the problem that uh, health workers who got offered the vaccine early on, uh, many, many times did not take the vaccine. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not like everybody will take this vaccine once it's, uh, it's available for them. And then also, um, if you look into some subpopulations, it may matter really a lot that you make the vaccine accessible. So also in Germany, amongst the elderly, not everybody took the vaccine or amongst the less educated, we see they are very, very vulnerable, often ending up in ICU and so on. Um, so it's, it's, it's important to think about these subgroups too and getting them on board. Mm. I mean, I'm, I, I think it's, uh, it, there's a good reason to be careful because like in the US, as soon as people feel like it's over and it's it's getting better, maybe then the critical point comes when a lot of people won't um, um, feel the need to be vaccinated uh, still and, and, and so on. So maybe that's also something to keep in, in mind. That's what I, I understand. So are you talking to German firms or companies uh, who are willing to... to do such a test or to apply uh, these incentives? Yeah, and for example, in contact with hospitals, because uh, there's quite some interest in uh, thinking about these uh, approaches and also to other uh, employers. Um, and another problem, um, and this is very much in line with what you said, uh, dear Thomas, is that uh, in the US, we see there's many people who do not um, come and pick up the second uh, shot of their vaccine. Um, so, so also there uh, may be something that we, a problem that we will see here uh, too. Mm. We're talking a lot about economics and uh, new paradigms and, and markets and, and so on. So there's obviously a link um, 
because people might ask, why should we incentivize people? If people decide just not to, to be vaccinated, it's up to them. They have to, to know. And some people say, well, they just have to be informed and get some information about it, and then they will be vaccinated. So what is the, the, the core argument? Why should we influence people uh, in that decision? Um, when it comes to the vaccine, we have a kind of public good. So we want as many as possible um, to take this vaccine so we can control the virus. And um, in, in this sense, it's really not just about the, the individual. And, 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 and I think this, uh, what we see in these studies is that uh, it can really help to think about a different approaches. So if you bring in the behavioral perspective, uh, this can really help. Um, but also the, I would say, more standard neoclassical approach uh, can, can obviously help. So it's really a, a blend of methods that may be quite successful um, to motivate people here. Mm. Um, is, is there any, because you are working with your colleague on, on US data and US people, just a maybe naive question, but is there um, a difference between Americans and Germans, or do you have to be careful about may or, or possible differences between countries if you do such research? Um, sure, you cannot transfer results one on one to other countries, but um, we see differences in the treatment effects, and this is always good. You know, if, if you see there's a causal impact, depending on whether the appointment is pre scheduled or not. Um, I think we may underestimate the impact for Germany because here is so stressful. And I hear that from so many different uh, angles that it's so stressful to get an appointment. Um, so maybe here, if we pre scheduled the appointments, there would be even larger effects. But already there, uh, the effects are significant. Um, yeah, so 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 uh, I, I think that would be would be my position on that. And then also, uh, if you look into questionnaire data, it's not that different actually. So also from Germany, the the willingness to take the vaccine, I wouldn't but want to overemphasize the absolute values of willingness to vaccinate because this changes over time, but it's not so far away from what we see in Germany. Mm. Do you think it would be um, good to, to incentivize people on a broader scale, so whatever the whole country, not only in firms, some companies, but um, do this in a, at a national level or state level? Yeah, I think it's really worth thinking about that, given that the social value of taking this vaccine is so high. We, had to, we have a lot of room for compensations. And I think we should not forget the social value. I feel in the debates, it's, it's sometimes a bit understressed how important it is, what an important social activity it is to take the vaccine. And I think we should make it uh, super accessible. So that should be something, you know, you just go into the city or whatever, and you can just pop in somewhere and, and get your shot. I think that would be really important too, specifically to reach um, some subgroups like the less educated. Mm. Is there something more to learn about this research? Because you're talking about common goods, about societal uh, dimensions going beyond individuals. That's something we are talking about a lot in our workshop and our work. Uh, so is there something to learn from this uh, COVID testing and vaccination uh, tests and, and experiments that you're doing? I think actually when it comes to climate change, we have a quite similar problem that it's really about something of high social relevance and it's, it's far beyond the individual perspective. And, um, and also there, uh, I, I think that we need a blend of behavioral approaches and these uh, standard economic approaches. Um, so we, of course, have to motivate people to um, change their consumption behaviors. Uh, and, and we do that. Um, I mean, there's defaults to uh, suggest, for example, green energy contracts to consumers and so on. Yeah, very often you see that they are somehow nudged into uh, going into a more like green contract. Um, but it's also important that people uh, fear the, the true social cost um, of, uh, of this uh, climate change problem. And, and there, I, I think many times we, we fail at, at, at doing so, so far. Well, yeah, I so think I think we really need both these, both these mm -hmm. approaches. 
Yeah. What, what I like about it, I mean, you know, about the climate discussion, and we will have a climate discussion just after this session. Um, it's very often about um, of, uh, of about hindering people to do something or to uh, to give ne negative incentives. And your approach, in if you if I put it one to one by one to to this uh, example or to climate would be to incentivize people. Would you have an example of, of how to do this positive incentive or even this choice ar architecture to apply on something uh, which is climate rela rela related? Um, yeah, I mean, with the energy transition, we need much more flexibility in uh, consumption behaviors. And uh, there, I think, is a lot of room for standard approaches. So to just... Um, illustrate as uh, so people see uh, what the value of uh, being flexible uh, really means. We will need that. Um, but also, of course, behaviorally, uh, first approach is to make this transparent so that people understand, oh, when the sun is shining, when there is wind, this is a good time that I um, put energy into my car, for example. Yeah, And, 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 and uh, um, of, of course, uh, there, there's lots of room to work with the defaults too, to encourage people to um, show more flexibility in the energy consumption. But I think this will be key and then not only for the households, but of course also for, for companies yeah, where, where a lot of things uh, are, are not stressed that much that far, but we will, we will need that. Is, is there um, are colleagues or just by interest, are there colleagues or in, in your field who are working on this on you know, doing the same experiments on climate behavior, would that be something which should be developed much more? Yeah, we are currently actually at KIT um, together with uh, uh, Mannheim. Um, we are uh, quite a bit uh, working in this direction currently, and we want to understand what smart meters do and how um, energy flexibility can be supported and how the information should be presented. Uh, so that would be something. And we also want to look into companies, not just uh, the households, because also on the company side, there is uh, much more that, that could be done and needs to be done if we really want to have a successful uh, transition. Mm 